In September of 1939, Britain and France went to war as allies against the common threat of Nazi Germany. Just 12 months later, the erstwhile partners were reluctantly shooting at each other. The reasons were complex. During the mid-war years, Britain's Royal Navy had been run down to an astonishing degree. Although it remained the largest in the world, this had only been achieved by arbitrarily increasing the service life of individual vessels and thus avoiding the necessity of building many new ships. Even with this programme slippage, for the first time in 150 years it became official Royal Navy policy to rely on allies for undoubted naval superiority over potential enemies. The French Navy, which had been revitalised by the energetic leadership of Admiral Dallan, was an integral part of this policy now that the Italians had openly sided with the Axis. The military situation in France by mid-June of 1940 had become so grave that French Premier Reynaud considered that he would have to ask for an armistice, in spite of admonitions from hotheads like General de Gaulle. Rather shamefacedly, Reynaud consulted with his allies before approaching the Germans. The British government, for their part, understood the situation perfectly. They agreed that France should submit, for they realised that the French army was incapable of further resistance. The French navy, however, was a different matter altogether. It had not collapsed like the army had. For example, French naval officers had successfully evacuated all ships capable of steaming from the Channel and Biscay ports. Some had headed for Britain, but the majority had sailed for the French colonies in Africa. If the French were now to become non-belligerents, the balance of power at sea would shift markedly, especially in the Mediterranean. The Royal Navy, with its fleets based at Alexandria and Gibraltar, would be both heavily outnumbered and divided by the centrally positioned Italians. The new French government, based at the town of Vichy under the old hero Marshal Patin, negotiated it as best it could. The final conditions of the armistice with regard to the French fleet were in fact rather lenient. Apart from ships needed for colonial defence, the navy was to be retained in French-owned ports and disarmed under German supervision. The Nazis did take over a few coastal defence ships and minesweepers, but undertook not to seize the bulk of the fleet for their own use. Dalan, who had become Minister of Marine as well as Commander-in-Chief in the new Vichy government, gave his solemn word to Churchill that the fleet would never be allowed to fall into German hands, and in fact he did issue secret orders to his commanders to that effect. Notwithstanding these assurances, few strategists in London believed that if the Germans decided to seize the ships, there was much chance that they would fail. This could not be allowed to happen if Britain was to be taken at all seriously in its determination to continue the war these ships could give the Axis virtual equality at sea. Accordingly, the British began to draw up plans to neutralise French naval forces. On July the 3rd, armed parties silently boarded and seized French warships in Plymouth and Portsmouth. Simultaneously, French ships in Alexandria agreed to disarm themselves after diplomatic representations by Admiral Cunningham. At Dakar in West Africa, several powerful elements of the Vichy fleet, the centrepiece being the modern battleship Richelieu, ignored the British ultimatum to either join the Royal Navy, scuttle or disarm. Consequently, on July the 8th, aircraft from the light carrier Hermes torpedoed the Richelieu, and that night a depth charge planted under a stern by a small boat further damaged her. Satisfied that the giant warship had been neutralised for at least the foreseeable future, the British withdrew. But these diverse successes were largely nullified by disaster at Mers el Kabir near Oran. Here a similar ultimatum to that delivered at Dakar was also rebuffed, and with much reluctance, force was used. British warships bombarded the port and the ships in the harbour. Three battleships were destroyed and 1,400 French sailors killed. Even then, a fourth battleship, together with its escorts, managed to evade the British and reach Toulon. Not surprisingly, these events caused enormous animosity towards the British throughout the French Navy. Active collaboration with the Germans increased. Recruits to the fledgling Free French Movement dried up almost immediately. Iran was an enormous embarrassment to both Winston Churchill and General de Gaulle, who had fled to London and was planning to mobilise a French army from the many thousands who had been evacuated from Dunkirk and Norway. Nevertheless, he persevered, and by early August the Free French Movement was 7,000 strong and had been recognised by the British Parliament as an ally, having national autonomy under British command. The Vichy government bitterly denounced all these British actions and broke off diplomatic relations, for good measure, they also declared de Gaulle to be a traitor and a renegade. He was found guilty in absentia by a military tribunal and sentenced to death. In spite of this, encouraging messages of support soon began to reach de Gaulle, especially from France's then extensive colonial empire. 
There was evidence that a large proportion of colonial officials were lukewarm in their support of the Vichy government. After all, many of these colonies lay next to British territories that they were dependent on for trade. The North African colonies were too susceptible to German influence, and the Pacific ones were too far away. But the West African colonies, Senegal, Sudan, Guinea, the Ivory Coast and Dahomey, could become a base for the Free French Movement and a powerful springboard for a return to Europe. De Gaulle's eyes began to turn to West Africa, and in particular to its capital, Dakar. The town of Dakar was of immense strategic importance. Situated on the westernmost point of the African continent, it was the eastern end of the shortest transatlantic route. It had an international airfield, one of the best ports in Africa, and a large naval base. It was strongly fortified and would be of great value in holding the West Atlantic sea routes. Conversely, in Axis hands it would be an ideal base from which to attack the important sea communications between Britain and the Cape. Dakar was also a rallying point for the sparsely settled West African colonies. The governor of West Africa, Boisson, had moved the entire colonial administration there. A tough and popular leader, he was carrying out an energetic campaign against free French sympathisers, many of whom had been arrested. Nevertheless, messages of support continued to reach de Gaulle. The morale of the Vichy garrison was reported to be low. There had even been a mutiny among some of the sailors. In mid-July of 1940, de Gaulle put forward a proposal to land at Conakry in French Guinea with a small force and then march inland, gathering support as he went. His force would then swing north and approach Dakar from inland, cutting the supply routes. This would emphasise the French nature of the operation and reduce the possibility of bloodshed. It was a bold plan, but it underestimated the difficulties of moving through Africa, of which de Gaulle knew nothing, and also the possibility of Vichy intervention. De Gaulle was forced to admit he would need help and modified his proposal to include a Royal Navy blockade of Dakar. On August the 3rd, Churchill cautiously approved the idea. Then, at a meeting on August the 6th, the British Prime Minister unexpectedly put forward an altered plan of action. His reasoning was that, although the rewards of occupying Dakar were enormous, so too were the risks. A failed attempt could provide the Germans with the excuse they needed to seize all French bases, which would be a severe blow to Britain's cause. The Americans in particular would not be impressed. There was also the possibility that a repetition of the Iran debacle might push the Vichy government into a declaration of war. The French forces in North Africa were formidable, including 70 submarines and over 600 combat aircraft. If Vichy were to openly side with the Axis, the British position in the Middle East would become untenable. The originally conceived operation would take weeks or even months to execute, which would increase the tension between the British and Vichy. Besides, the Royal Navy simply did not have enough ships to maintain a blockade for such a length of time. Any operation would instead have to be short and decisive. Churchill's vision was of a huge Allied fleet arriving off Dakar, intimidating the local population. An envoy would be dropped, bearing a note pressuring the governor, either cooperate or face overwhelming odds. Only if this did not work would landings be made. De Gaulle accepted the modified plan, principally because he was anxious to avoid a Frenchman versus Frenchman fight. With these constraints, on August 7th, Operation Menace, the occupation of Dakar, was officially sanctioned. The target date was to be September 8th. The free French forces available were not large. There were only two battalions, one of them Foreign Legion, a single company of tanks, and two box flights of British-supplied Blenheims and Hurricanes. Of necessity, the British would have to provide the bulk of the forces, but for political reasons, their involvement was to be limited to just the bare minimum in order to guarantee success. The British contingent consisted of four battalions of Royal Marines and some specialised units under a Major General Irwin. General de Gaulle was reportedly very angry at the positive warships assigned to the operation, seeing it as a lack of resolve on the part of his allies. In fact, the naval covering force for Mace was quite substantial. It was drawn from the Home Fleet, South Atlantic Command and Force H at Gibraltar, Designated Force M, it was placed under the command of Vice Admiral Cunningham. The biggest weakness of Force M was that the component warships had been drawn from so many stations and had little time to exercise together. There were also problems with some of the individual vessels. Barham had only recently been recommissioned and had gunnery left a lot to be desired, which would be a problem if the Vichy garrison resisted. The only carrier available, Ark Royal, would have to provide all the air cover for the operation with a total of 54 rather low-performance planes principally swordfish and skewer dual-purpose fighter-dive bombers. Planning for menace began at once, but swiftly became bogged down. An amphibious operation of this magnitude had never been carried out before, and staff struggled with a huge list of details. As late as August 24th, 
three of the British Marine Battalions were sent to Scapa Flow for a crash course in making opposed beach landings, for which there was an acute shortage of assault landing craft. Knowledge of local conditions, suitable beaches, surf conditions, etc. was sparse. The plan itself changed on an almost daily basis. Unsurprisingly with all this, the proposed date for the strike proved to be wildly optimistic. The troop ships were supposed to make 12 knots and reach Dakar in 16 days. In fact, the ships hired by de Gaulle to carry the mechanical transport could only make 8 or 9 knots. Moreover, a wide detour into the Atlantic had to be made in order to avoid German submarines, imposing a delay of another 5 more days. Another 3 days were lost in the complexity of loading, and fuel constraints meant a refueling stop of 2 days would have to be made at Freetown in Sierra Leone. Even so, a slower convoy of five merchants carrying food and mechanical transports had to be sailed on ahead. The strike was rescheduled for the 19th of September. There was also the constant worry that the existence of the operation would leak to the Vichy authorities. Security was extremely lax in the Free French forces. Free French officers quite openly toasted the coming operation in restaurants in London. During embarkation at Liverpool, a packing case broke open and scattered hundreds of pro-free French leaflets headed to the people of Dakar throughout the docks. De Gaulle himself purchased a tropical uniform from a London tailor, stating specifically that it was for use in Africa. In contrast, security amongst the British was, if anything, too tight. Moreover, the political basis that underlined Operation Menace came into question. When the Vichy authorities had broken off diplomatic relations, they had expelled two British liaison officers who had been stationed at Dakar. On August 28th, these men finally arrived in London and delivered a disquieting report. Their impression of the political situation in Dakar conflicted sharply with the one upon which the operation was based. In their view, both the populace and garrison were strongly supportive of the Vichy government. They further pointed out the strength of the defences and their conviction that any attempt to make a landing would certainly be opposed. If this was true, the prospects for menace were not good. Notwithstanding all the practical difficulties and this latest intelligence, the Joint Commanders decided not to abort the operation. They thought that it was now too late to cancel. Besides, there had also been good news from Africa. On August 21st, Governor Eboué of Chad had declared for Free France, and his example was soon followed by the French Cameroons, Ubari Shari, now the Central African Republic, and the Congo. Ubangi and Gabon followed suit soon afterwards, and though Gabon renounced its decision on the 31st, following the arrival of Vichy generals and troops, its capital, Libreville, was isolated and secured by Free French forces from the Cameroons a few weeks later. It looked like the dream of a Free French Africa was coming true. The three separate groups comprising Operation Menace finally set sail on August the 31st from Scapa Flow, the Clyde and Liverpool. Disaster struck almost immediately. The cruiser Fiji was torpedoed by U-32 and forced to return for repairs. Her place was taken by the cruiser Australia, hurriedly drafted in from the home fleet. Worse was to follow. There had been no time to issue detailed orders for the operation and staffs had to work flat out to write all the instructions. Because of the need to maintain radio silence, communication between commanders was restricted to Aldislam, which slowed it down considerably. Then, late on 11th of September, came the news that a Vichy squadron had passed through the Straits of Gibraltar and was at large in the Atlantic. The obvious implication of the appearance of these French ships was that the Vichy government had got wind of menace and were attempting to relieve the Dakar garrison, or perhaps even seize the port for the Germans. This Vichy squadron, known as Force Y, and under the command of Rear Admiral Baruja, consisted of three cruisers and three destroyers. They had passed through the Straits of Gibraltar at 0835 on September 11th, were heading south down the African coast. The British Admiralty ordered Force H at Gibraltar to intercept and question them, directing them, if necessary, to non-occupied ports. The battlecruiser Renown had already been brought to one hour's notice to steam by Admiral Somerville, the commander of Force H, on the assumption that she might be needed, but without instructions had not stopped the French force. She eventually set off in pursuit at 16.30, accompanied by the destroyers Griffin, Velox and Vidette but the French ships had too great a head start. They made a stopover at Casablanca to refuel during the night of September 11th, where Boris learned that Force H was pursuing him. Fearing another Iran, he cut short the stop at Casablanca and, aided by bad weather, slipped by Force H. Under Admiralty orders, the escort for Menace also attempted an interception, but by the time Force M was on station, it was the evening of September 14th and the three Vichy cruisers had reached Dakar. 
an event that was widely broadcast by Vichy and swiftly confirmed by air patrols from Ark Royal. Consequently, Cunningham reset his course back to Freetown, detaching the cruiser Cumberland to keep a watch off the car. It seems incredible that the Vichy squadron had been allowed to pass Gibraltar when a major strike was in the process of being executed at Dakar, especially when by the terms of the armistice, the British had to be notified of any movement of Vichy ships. In fact, the British consul at Tangier did cable the news that the Vichy squadron intended to move through the Straits to Admiral North at Gibraltar on the evening of 9th of September. Similarly, the following evening the British naval attaché in Madrid was informed that Force Y had left Toulon and would pass the Straits on the 11th. Unfortunately, the tight security that surrounded Menace excluded all of these individuals from any knowledge of the operation. None of them understood the significance of the Vichy movement and no special effort was made to pass the information on to the Admiralty, at least partly due to the fact that the Blitz on London was then at its height. Indeed, the Admiralty only learnt that Force Y was at sea when the destroyer Hotspur, on patrol in the Mediterranean, spotted them 50 miles east of Gibraltar heading for the Straits. In fact, the Vichy government had no idea at all as an operation against a car was in progress. They had become worried by the defections in the equatorial regions and decided to enforce their authority by sending Force Y via Dakar to Libreville. If the Free French movement continued to gain ground, it could give the Germans an excuse to occupy key African colonies. By a show of force, Vichy believed that not only could they deal with de Gaulle, but he could demonstrate to the Germans that they were capable of dealing with de Gaulle. Barucci set off at all speed to Casablanca, making no efforts to disguise his presence. As diplomatic relations between Vichy and Britain had been broken off after the Iran affair, the British were unaware of all of this. So, on September 16th, the War Cabinet decided Menace had been compromised and instructed Cunningham to cancel the operation and sail on to Douala in the French Cameroons. As matters stood, no one officially knew about Operation Menace and therefore it could be called off without any loss of prestige. The assorted Menace convoys arrived at Freetown between the 14th and 17th September and commenced refuelling, while Cunningham, Irwin and de Gaulle discussed their options. De Gaulle was concerned about the effect that a powerful Vichy squadron at sea would have on the coastal colonies. He remained confident that he could bring Dakar over to the Free French. As far as Cunningham was concerned, naval position remained unchanged. The cruisers altered nothing. Aerial reconnaissance from Ark Royal confirmed they were lying at anchor with awning spread and consequently made excellent bombing targets. As far as the position on land went, there was no conclusive proof that Force Y had brought reinforcements to the garrison. The three commanders therefore cabled London their collective opinion that Operation Menace was still salvageable. Churchill was so pleased with this display of fighting spirit that on September the 18th the order to cancel was rescinded and the best method of proceeding left to the commanders on the ground. Unfortunately, the Vichy French were to get their blow in first. Governor Boisson had become increasingly anxious about the free French gains in equatorial Africa and the increased British naval activity in the area. He deemed it vital that the French flag be shown as quickly as possible. The ultimate destination of Force Y, Libreville, had no refuelling facilities. Borrejou planned, therefore, to send the tanker Tarn, escorted by the cruiser Primagé and the freighter Poitiers, ahead so that fuel and general stores would be available for the rest of Force Y when they arrived later. The Vichy ships were not to get far, however. News that the French had sailed from Dakar quickly reached Cunningham and ships were dispatched to intercept them. On September 16th, 100 miles south of Dakar, Cumberland caught up with Poitiers. Upon being challenged, the crew of the French vessel set her on fire and abandoned ship, leaving Cumberland to sink her. On 18th September, Cornwall and Delhi succeeded in catching up with Primage and Tarn and ordered them to turn back to Casablanca. The Vichy cruiser radioed for instructions, and realising that Primage was no match for the two British cruisers, Amor Borouge ordered her to comply. This effectively cancelled the Vichy Admiral's mission, as without Tarn there would not be no fuel supply waiting at Libreville. Force Y turned back to Dakar. At 9am on September 19th, the cruiser Australia, sailing to relieve Cumberland from her Dakar patrol, ran into Force Y. The British ships gave chase, and although they had no speed advantage, the strain eventually told. The cruiser Gloire suffered an engine failure and her speed fell to just 15 knots. Australia escorted her to Casablanca too. The other French cruisers held their course and managed to reach Dakar at 0550 on September 20th, where Admiral Borrigou was relieved of his command. <laughs>
Cunningham's prompt action had undoubtedly saved Ecuador and Africa for the Allies and partially succeeded in denying reinforcements to Dakar. However, the defenders had now been warned and the forced movement of ships caused menace to be delayed yet again. Force M finally sailed from Freetown in three separate groups from September the 19th to 21st, carefully timed so that all the ships would arrive at dawn on the 23rd. In spite of the fact that the Vichy government now knew that an operation against Dakar was planned, the voyage was uneventful. All now depended on the response of Dakar. The final plan of operation for Menace was relatively unchanged from Churchill's original concept. The fleet was to make a majestic or inspiring arrival of Dakar in order to intimidate the local population. General de Gaulle would broadcast a personal appeal by radio for his troops to be allowed to land. Aircraft from Ark Royal would then deluge the town with leaflets, while two small passenger planes landed four free French officers at Oukham Airfield, hopefully to secure it for Allied use. After some time to allow the inhabitants to consider their position, five emissaries would then enter the harbour by motorboat and deliver a personal message to the Governor-General. If these entreaties did not work, the British would assist Derry Gaulle's men to make a landing. If the response was totally hostile, the situation codenamed Nasty, the Free French would withdraw and the British would suppress the defences by force. This last event was considered unlikely, however. The general feeling, from commanders to private soldiers, was that the defences would fire a few shots for form's sake and then surrender. In the event, it all went horribly wrong for the Allies. On the fateful morning of September 23rd, an unexpected and completely unseasonable fog covered the entire area, blocking sight of the fleet from Dakar and obliterating any psychological effect that might have been achieved. De Gaulle did make his broadcast as planned, but the Vichy authorities responded with great speed. The general alarm was sounded and all defences were stood too. Truckloads of troops patrolled the streets, effectively suppressing any insurrection. The four officers landed at Ukum were quickly recaptured, and one had in his pocket a list of de Gaulle's chief supporters in the town, who were promptly rounded up by the Vichy authorities. Two Curtis fighters were then scrambled, and these quickly chased off the four swordfish from Ark Royal that had been scattering leaflets over the town. The five emissaries were met at the docks by the Vichy fleet commander, Admiral Landrieu, who had heard de Gaulle's broadcast. He ordered them to be arrested and they were forced to flee amidst a hail of machine gun fire, two being wounded. The force Y cruisers were ordered to raise steam and disperse into the outer roads. Two of the submarines, Perse and Ajax, attempted to move out of the harbour, to be promptly pursued by the British destroyers Forsyth and Inglefield. Then the Vichy sloop Calais spotted the Allied fleet through the murk and passed on an accurate report of its strength to Landrieu. The large numbers of transports made it clear that a landing was imminent. Landrieu quickly alerted all his forces and prepared to fight. With his initial entreaties summarily rejected, de Gaulle took as tough a stance. He broadcast another appeal, this time with a veiled threat of direct action if there was further resistance. When there was no response, he tried again, even more threateningly. In reply, at 10.30, the Vichy shore batteries opened fire at the Allied wing destroyers through a momentary clearing of the fog. Force M had taken up bombardment positions in case the plan to suppress the defences and effect a landing had to be undertaken. The pervasive fog restricted visibility, however, and forced the British ships into positions closer than they would have normally taken, and thus into range of the fort's guns. By 1100, the whole fleet was being shelled. The British did not return fire immediately, and when they did, they only fired a few salvos at the forts, in accordance with the decision to use the least amount of force. Barham engaged one at less than 6,000 yards range, but even so, some shells overshot and landed in the crowded town beyond. Several of the merchant ships in the inner harbour were also hit, one Danish vessel, the Tacoma, being set on fire. Vichy shooting was slow but accurate, and Cumberland was damaged so severely by a 9.4-inch shell hit in her engine room that she was forced to withdraw completely. Soon after, the Vichy submarine per se attempted a surface torpedo attack on the Barham and was sunk by the British cruiser Dragon. Dragon moved to pick up survivors, but made herself a target of the Gori Island battery. She was repeatedly straddled and took so many splint hits that she was also detached back to escort the convoy. This gunnery exchange was clearly being unproductive, and the British force was ordered to haul off. By 11.30, all firing had died away. Just before noon, a message was received by Cunningham from the garrison confirming that any landing would be opposed. It was apparent that appeals had failed, but there was a contingency plan. After hurried consultations between the expedition commanders, 
it was proposed to use the free French sloops to land troops onto the shoals of Rufiscu, a small port ten miles to the east of Dakar. The fog made the business of transferring marines from the troop ships immensely confusing. A reconnaissance plane from Ukum spotted the preparations and at 1600 the destroyer Ladasu left the anchorage east of Gori Island and moved to investigate. She was engaged by Australia Greyhound and Fury, disabled, set on fire and finally beached at Rafisik. She managed to fire two torpedoes at Australia but both missed. Landro, now aware that something was happening at the east end of the bay, hurriedly dispatched Georges Legu and Montcalm to the area. At 1730, the two small free French sloops arrived at Rafisk Bay and, after silencing a battery near the lighthouse, dropped their boats laden with soldiers. The Vichy defenders waited until the larger sloop was committed before uncovering a four inch battery and beginning a deliberate fire. At this critical juncture, the two Vichy cruisers were spotted by a British plane. The sloops were obviously in considerable danger, there being no larger British ships close enough to intervene and had to hurriedly re embark their troops and withdraw. In Dakar itself, South Africans made a demonstration in favour of de Gaulle, but Richelieu fired some of her secondary guns at them and the rising was swiftly dispersed. With the Rafisku landing foiled, the three menaced commanders met to decide their next move. September 23rd had ended in complete failure, partly because of the weather, partly because of the poor radio communications, but mostly because, against all expectations, the Vichy had stood firm. There seemed no alternative but to either humiliatingly abandon the operation or to bombard the town. De Gaulle was of the opinion that bombarding French civilians would do his cause no good at all. So it was agreed that it would be made clear that the Free French would not take part in such an action. Around about 2300, Churchill made the decision by ordering them, having begun, we must go on to the end, stop at nothing. Thus spurred on by this, the joint commanders decided to try a bluff. An ultimatum was broadcast at 2345, explaining the Allied position that Dakar could not be given to the Germans. The town must be surrendered by 0600 the following day, or the Free French would withdraw and let the British attack. At 0430, Boisson gave the defiant reply, France has entrusted Dakar to me, I shall defend it to the end. With their terms rejected, the Allies now had no recourse left if they wanted menace to continue. The Free French ships withdrew, and the British battleships and cruisers were ordered to take up bombardment positions. Originally, these were to have been about eight miles from Dakar, but although the fog that had so bedeviled operations on the 23rd had partially cleared, the town was still completely hidden at such a range. The fleet had to back away in order to reform for a shorter ranged attack, and then close in again. The first contact came at 0700, when the Vichy submarine Ajax, on patrol eight miles southwest of Gori Island, spotted the British battleships. She attempted an attack, but was badly damaged by both gunfire and a hail of depth charges. Forced to the surface 90 minutes later, her commander ordered her scuttle to avoid capture. Meanwhile, Ark Royal launched three successive airstrikes. The first, of six skewers armed with semi-armour-piercing bombs, was directed at Richelieu. The giant battleship was taken by surprise, but no hits were scored, probably due to lack of practice. Skewers doubled as fighter aircraft, and their training in the run-up to Menace seems to have emphasised this duty at the expense of their dive-bombing actions. The second strike was aimed at the Cap Manuel battery and consisted of six swordfish armed with general-purpose bombs. Swordfish were not designed for this kind of attack and little damage was done. The third strike was also of swordfish armed with torpedoes this time and was aimed at the French cruisers. By now the defences were ready. No less than three swordfish were lost to ground fire and one more was shot down by a Curtis fighter. Not one torpedo hit. At 0930, Resolution, Barham, Australia and Devonshire engaged the Vichy ships, which gamely fired back. Although Richelieu was still moored to the dockside, the Vichy cruisers were zigzagging in the outer roads and they made elusive targets. French destroyers immediately began laying smoke to thicken the mist. By 10 minutes past 10, the bay was completely obscured. The British were forced to withdraw again. As they moved southwards, they were ineffectively attacked by high-altitude Martin bombers. The bombardment was resumed in the afternoon, when the French used smoke again. Byram engaged the Richelieu and Resolution the batteries on Gorry Island. The cruisers were also allocated targets, but owing to a signalling mishap, they turned away and did not take part in the bombardment. The defenders concentrated their fire on Barham. The flagship was hit four times, although she suffered no serious damage. The heavy smoke again forced the order to cease fire about 13.30. Richelieu had been hit only once, 
and although the Cap Manuel battery had been destroyed, most of the shore forts were still intact, and several of the smaller Vichy batteries had not even been dilocated yet. The Vichy Air Force was becoming increasingly aggressive, making airstrikes and even reconnaissance missions from Ark Royal hazardous. At 1400, Cunningham, Irwin and de Gaulle gathered yet again to discuss what to do. It was now clear that the defences of Dakar had been badly underestimated. De Gaulle suggested an alternative strategy. Small parties of free French troops would land at lightly defended positions along the coast and march on Dakar overland, while the fleet blockaded the harbour. The only alternative was to abandon the expedition. The British commanders thought that no landing could be feasible while Richelieu and the force wide cruisers were active, but they were equally chary of abandoning the long-prepared operation. They therefore decided, independently and without the general's knowledge, to resume bombardment of the defences on the 25th, providing the conditions were favourable. In the meantime, they resorted to air attack with a strike against the Vichy cruisers. Nine swordfish, escorted by three skewers, made a low-level torpedo run at around 15.30. The French were caught by surprise, but by good evasive action, avoided all the torpedoes fired at them. Two of the swordfish were lost, although the crews were later safely picked up by British destroyers. The new day dawned bright and hopeful for the Allies. The weather had cleared and visibility was extremely good. The British battleships moved to their bombardment positions approximately 21,000 yards from Dakar, using their walrus seaplanes to direct fall of shot. Seeing their stately progress, the French decided to pre-empt them. At around 0900, Richelieu opened fire at around 23,000 yards, and the British, rather startled, returned fire almost simultaneously. Richelieu, being kept clear of the jetty by tugs, was almost immediately hit by a 15-inch shell from Barham. Flames shot up, but they were quickly brought to control, and Barham's walrus was shot down. The British ships continued to close their pre-arranged gun line, but this took them into the sights of the last Vichy submarine, the Beveziers, which had been cunningly positioned by Admiral Landro. Captain Lancelot of the Beveziers had excised continuously with the British before the armistice, and he was familiar with their methods. He recognised the signal to turn onto the gun line, and in spite of being detected and heavily attacked, fired a full spread of torpedoes at resolution as she reached the turning point, hitting her once amidships. The battleship immediately lifted heavily to port and lost all power, and Inglefield and Forsyth were ordered to screen her with smoke. It was a sweet moment for Vichy, for resolution had played a major part in the attack on Iran. Without her, Cunningham's force was outgunned by the Vichy defences, but they persisted for a few minutes yet. Barham took on the Richelieu alone, while Australia engaged the French cruisers, and Devonshire shot at the forts. In a 20-minute gun duel, Barham was hit once and Australia twice. It was now plain to Cunningham that the defences were just simply too strong to be overcome without sustaining unacceptable levels of damage, and so he decided to abandon the operation. The British ceased fire at 0912 and drew off. At 0918, French fighters shot down Australia's walrus plane. The British headed south at covering resolution. On two separate occasions, French Martin bombers made high-level attacks on her, and in fact she was fortunate not to be hit again. The ultimate irony was that Cunningham had pulled out too early. If he had held on for just a few minutes longer, the price for which so much blood had been spilled and so much damage had been suffered would have been his. Unknown to the British and Free French, Boisson was writing out Dakar's surrender just as Cunningham's fleet turned away. The garrison had almost expended their ammunition, but because of the withdrawal of the battleships, the note was never sent. As the dejected Allied fleet withdrew southwards for the last time, they were not to know they had missed victory by a matter of minutes. The War Cabinet in London approved the decision to abandon Menace a few hours later. Barham took resolution in tow and the entire fleet retired to Freetown. Politically, Dakar was a heavy Allied setback. It was apparent that the garrison had chosen Vichy above Free France, and Vichy propaganda made sure everyone knew as well. The failure to seize the port was a blow to British and especially Royal Navy prestige, at a time when both the will and ability to stand alone against the Germans was being severely questioned. The Americans were particularly disappointed. Dakar in Axis hands endangered their security too, as it bypassed the main British naval bases that otherwise blocked Germany and Italy from the Atlantic. The failure of Operation Menace was primarily down to faulty intelligence, both of the physical defence of Dakar and the morale of the garrison. Although there had been some indiscipline amongst French naval reservists in July 1940, this had mostly been about service conditions, not dissatisfaction with Vichy policy. In August, Darlan sent Landru to restore efficiency and discipline, 
a task in which he succeeded only too well. The operation itself was hastily and sketchily drawn up, and its timetable disrupted by delays and changes of plan. The unseasonable weather limited the effect of the fleet. The unexpected arrival of Vichy reinforcements, on top of all that, ended any hope of success. There were some positive results to the Allies from the debacle at Dakar. The Vichy squadron never reached Equatorial Africa, and so de Gaulle was able to subsequently land at Douala and rally the French African colonies. More importantly, France's ability to defend its colonies had been proven, and provided Vichy with the ammunition they needed to forestall German attempts to intervene in colonial affairs. Finally, the Allies learnt a great many useful lessons about amphibious operations, which were to stand them in good stead in the future. On the military side, no British ship was lost during Menace, but several were very badly damaged. Cumberland was out of service for two weeks, Fiji for six months, and Resolution for a whole year. Several other ships sustained lesser damage, and at least 12 aircraft were lost. Happily, there were less than 50 casualties. The Vichy French had lost two destroyers and two submarines. There was also damage done to both Richelieu and the coastal forts. This was particularly serious, as the facilities at Dakar were such that repairs to damage of this nature were very difficult to make. French personnel losses are unknown. They were certainly higher than Allied casualties, but were nevertheless still quite light. The destroyer Ladassu, beached at Rafisik, was subsequently refloated and towed to Bizerte for repairs, which took nearly two years to complete. She was destroyed by the American Air Force in early 1943. Captain Lancelot and the crew of the Bevezes were lauded as heroes in France. The good captain survived to fight for the Allies later on in the war. Richelieu took nearly a year to repair. She remained at Dakar up until the torch landings in November of 1942, when the port and all its resources joined the Allied cause. She was refitted in America and then served in succession the Mediterranean Fleet, the Home Fleet and finally the Eastern Fleet, in all of which she made a very good impression. (laughs) 